the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and in turn, Ukrainian resistance is, is sometimes, I would even say usually, uh, uh, seen as a geopolitical fight over territory. Um, what I want to talk about today is something else. So that is that it's something more than a geopolitical fight, or that it's something more than simply a question of territory, or question of interest. That in fact, uh, what is going on is about how we give meaning to space. Um, I'm going to make this point by revisiting ancient Rome's 300 year conquest of the Samnites, uh, uh, a loose confederation of tribes located in the, uh, in the, in the inner part of Italy, uh, in, the, in, in the center of Southern Italy, uh, beginning of the fourth century BC and going on for several hundred years. I know that this sounds like a bad ending, but I promise that it will bear fruit uh, and end us up in an interesting place. So my point of departure is the tendency to reduce discussions of territory to matters of material interest and to see the struggle for territory as motivated by these interests, whether we're talking about uh, mineral resources, food resources, fresh water, security protections, um, all of which uh, Ukraine is, 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 has plentiful uh, resources uh, that would be interesting to someone. These motivations, I think, are certainly important, uh, but they leave out another critical aspect of space, the meaning we, the meaning we give to it. Oops. So that's going to be interesting. The, uh, uh, my, my little automatic thing didn't go. I, um, so so Yifu Tan, um, whose writings I recommend to anyone, because uh, they are absolutely fascinating. There's some longer books and some shorter books suggests that people cannot live in a space-time continuum. He says, the world to be livable must be reconstituted to reflect the human need for privileged location and boundaries. We locate ourselves in space, but we convert space to place, to something we recognize, to something that is familiar. We connect place to identities of uh, to, 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 I'm sorry, we, we connect space and place to narratives of identity and belonging. I'll give you a little Roman taste of this relationship of space to place uh, uh, and, how, uh, and how place to set out against the vastness of space and the unfamiliar, unfamiliarity of space. Uh, in Cicero's A Dream of Scipio, which is uh, the final book of his uh, On the Republic. Scipio, an important Roman leader, is lifted into space. And in space, he experiences the disorientation of astonishing distances and whirls of noise. The Roman place, the earth, is almost unrecognizable and insignificant from the distance of space. In imagining this vastness, Cicero suggests that if we were to see the whole earth from afar, we would see these regions that are habitable, and those that are wholly uncultivated. But in our return, there is a connection of bodily memory to place. That is, it's, 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 part, of, it's part of us. It's part of how we react to things. Uh, it's built into us. Cicero has Atticus say that we are, quote, affected in some mysterious way by places about which clusters, about which cluster memories of those whom we love and admire. In these recollections, Cicero points to us to the tangible artifacts uh, um, of earthly life. Odysseus, for example, as Cicero recalls, uh, forgoes the promise of divinity so that he can, quote, see Ithaca, uh, Ithaca once more. Quintus, on returning to the island of Fabrinus, points to his house that was rebuilt and extended by his father's care, dotting the landscape are memorials of one's ancestors as well, linking past to present. That is to say, place becomes meaningful to us, not just in terms of statues and in terms of monuments, but in terms of all of the different memories that we associate with aspects of that particular, of that particular uh, uh, place. We see in Ukraine, like in Rome as it began to conquer Italy, and eventually the Samnites, a violent collision of narratives of place. Now, scholars make different arguments about uh, the motivations for conquest, about why 
nations move into other nations. Some identify, for example, particular material interests that shape the acquisition and settling of space, uh, um, such as resources or land or harbors. Others, uh, what is called in what is called political realism, identify the interaction and perception that a state has of other states. Uh, um, for example, uh, John Mearsheimer has recently come out with an article, which I think is completely incorrect, uh, that argues that Russia's actions um, are driven by Russia's security concerns because of NATO expansion, and thus they react uh, um, in order to protect themselves. That's the idea of political realism, is that expansion is motivated by security concerns. Putin, interestingly, has made this suggestion as well, although I'm going to suggest that's not really what's going on. What these arguments don't account for is the emotional, affective aspects we associate with space. The space that is desired, the space that is conquered, the space that we are willing to sacrifice our lives for has meaning and is given meaning. That space is, mad, is imagined as a place that is connected to a larger narrative of identity. Both Rome and Russia give meaning to a space that they imagine as theirs. This has enormous implications for how we understand the conflict. Now, there is something intriguing uh, in the intersecting ways in which Rome and Russia imagine space and imagine the Samnite space and imagine the Ukrainian space. Rome didn't just say, um, we're interested in this um, and we have the military power to take it and so we're going to take it. I mean, I'm sure some thought that, but that wasn't, that's not how they articulated it. And, and remember, Rome doesn't start out as an empire. Rome starts out as a little polis, as a little community uh, that doesn't know that it's planning on expanding and taking over everything. Rome gave meaning to space uh, by way of a larger cultural narrative of, of a civilizing mission, of a promise of a new history. We see that civilizing mission articulated in the notion of this uh, Latin term humanitas, a term that refers to um, an elite version of like a culture and conduct uh, uh, to which both Romans and the rest of humankind could aspire. It refers to something like cultivation or something like refinement, encompassing everything from manners to morals, to dress, to literature, to the arts, to oratory, right, to, to, to everything that encompasses um, how we interact and understand ourselves. The notion points to gradations of progress from savagery to civilization by which people, potentially all people, uh, um, can become, quote, truly human. That is, one can become civilized, but, and this is critical, it is only by way of Rome as the carrier of this new history that other people can become civilized. Cicero describes Rome's obligation to govern the barbarous people. Cicero credits Caesar's extended command in Gades with introducing law and removing the, quote, ingrained barbarity of their customs and institutions. Pliny characterizes Rome as uniting scattered empires and bringing together jarring and uncouth tongues to give humankind humanitas. <clears throat> Cassius Dio relates the gradual introduction of new practices to the Germans and under careful watching, and this language is gonna, it gets repeated uh, in this current scenario, under careful watching, gradually forgetting and unlearning their old ways. And Tacitus describes, though he is being ironic uh, in this description, how Agricola introduced uh, uh, humanitas to the Britons, making them more Roman in language and manners and dress, altering the landscape by gathering populations together to have a marketplace and temples and houses, as well as educating the elite in the liberal arts. The meaning given to space provides a powerful justification for violence. For Rome, violence appears as a necessary moment uh, um, that, then, that then 
is overshadowed by or justified by the much larger progress of civilization. Violence is in fact justified, right, in the name of a new history. Moreover, and this becomes important, that there's never a point at which that violence is resolved. Uh, but in fact, there is always this sort of ever-present threat that civilization will be undone. And thus there is this continuing sort of, sort of threat of violence to keep a civilization in order. One might note Horace's concern that with civil war, the ground will be returned to wild animals and barbarians. The Samnites emerged in this context, not just as occupants of the space that preceded the founding, the movement of Rome into Italy, but also as a stranger who threatens to undo the narrative. Now I use this word stranger, um, which is it's sort of a substitute for the word the other, um, because the stranger is more present. Uh, the stranger is potentially part of us, uh, interacts with us, uh, uh, speaks the same language as us, for example, looks like us, has the, same, uh, has the same genealogy as us. But there's something in which they're seen as unfamiliar uh, or they are seen as, a, as suspiciously um, or they're seen as dangerous. Uh, um, and so it's not just a matter of distancing yourself because they're always present. And so there's this anxiety about this dangerous wild stranger that gets constructed by the community as a justification for taking over that particular space. The state seeks to control the movement uh, of the space of the wild stranger, altering space to erase memories of what came before, as well as constructing and connecting space to make it familiar. Russia also, imagine, uh, also, emerge, uh, also imagines Ukraine, um, as well as other surrounding territories, as components of the realization of a new history. In this case, a new history that is a return to an old history. For Putin, and for the right-wing philosopher uh, uh, who guides Putin, Alexander Dugin, Moscow is, quote, and this is interesting, Moscow is, quote, the third Rome. As one scholar comments, the first two Romes perished, the third stands, and there will be no fourth Rome, which is a Russian saying. With the emergence of the Russian state in the 15th century, uh, um, after the weakening of the Mongols, the Russian leaders, as of 1547, declared themselves no longer kings, but uh, emperors, or in Russian, czars, uh, which is derived from the Roman title of Caesar. Now, Putin sees Rome as the quote, and this is quoting from Putin, the spiritual and cultural inheritor of the legacy of the Roman and Byzantine empires, the center of a distinctly anti-European dominion, one powerful and authoritarian enough to withstand the perceived threats of liberal modernity, multiculturalism, and progressive values. We could add to that list also opposed to democracy. Where for the Romans, the Samnites were both like and unlike the Romans, and I'm gonna talk about this later. For Putin, Russia and Ukraine exist <clears throat> in spiritual unity, not only because of their shared Orthodox Christian faith, but also because both peoples claim the lineage and cultural ancestry of ancient Rus, a medieval, Kiev-centered, I had a phone call there, uh, Kiev-centered federation. The idea of spiritual, uh, of spiritual unity hints at a mystical strain in Putin's thinking. Indeed, he appears to see his imperial war as an earthly realization of a wider mythic battle between traditional order and progressive chaos. The conquest of Ukraine like, Ukraine, like Crimea and other territories before, is described by Putin as a return home. The return, not, to a, the, not the conquest of a space, but the return to a familiar place, right? A return to the familiar place. If Rome saw itself as carrying out the spread of humanitas, Russia sees itself as returning to a traditionalism of order, authority, honor, and hierarchy. Ukraine's resistance 
like that of the Samnites for Rome, marks a threat to Putin's narrative of identity and marks a transformation of the language used by Russia from a view of Ukraine as familiar to now the stranger. And in fact, Ukraine posed this threat before under Stalin. What is striking is the similar response, the desire to obliterate all vestiges of familiarity of Ukraine language and culture, including any vestige of a familiar space. So let's talk about the Samnites. In Libby's history, so during the, it, it, starting about the fourth century BC, Rome begins this steady expansion across all of Italy, uh, slowly, slowly uniting uh, um, uh, or unifying all of Italy under their, under their control. Um, in Libby's history, uh, um, after the Second Latin War, which is in the mid fourth century, uh, the Roman statesman and general uh, Camillus puts in stark terms the choices that uh, um, that Rome can that Rome faces um, as it begins to branch out and begins to conquer the different tribes uh, and towns of Italy. He says, "You may blot out all of Latium of 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 of, of uh, Italy, and make vast solitudes." of those places where you have often raised a splendid army of allies and used it through many a momentous war. Would you follow the example of your fathers and augment the state by receiving your conquered enemies as citizens? In short, Rome has two choices. You can obliterate whatever stands in the way, or you can continue to incorporate them, to make them Roman, uh, to bring them uh, into, uh, into part of Rome. And as Camillus makes clear, right, this is part of uh, a Roman founding notion that in fact, uh, it is an assembly of, of different tribes, of, of unfamiliar people, of, of, of different groups uh, that slowly become Roman and slowly become civilized under, the, under this sort of Roman idea. Livy, in fact, right, paints this sort of mythic picture uh, in describing this idea of unity that, in fact, um, all of the Romans and all the Italians sort of shared uh, uh, sort of a lot of common things together. They shared language, they shared customs, uh, they shared arms, they were friendly with each other, hung out with each other, uh, I, um, were oftentimes, right, had a lot of interactions with each other, uh, thus sort of justifying uh, this idea of sort of a homogeneous uh, Italy um, under Rome's rule. But in Livy's description of Italy as sharing all these characteristics with Rome, I, um, there was one group that is, that is noticeably lacking or missing, and that is the Samnites, um, who were not part of that group, nor would they become part of that group in the Roman imagination. Unlike these other Italian communities, the Samnites emerged in the Roman imagination as the dangerous stranger. The Samnites appear as an abstracted image of wildness that both defined an unfounded space, but also validated a Roman identity in civilizing or taming that space. Little is known of the origin of the Samnites. I'm one of the three people who even talks about them. Uh, um, they're, they're from the Indo-European Safan groups, which include the Sabines, who then become integrated into sort of Roman life. The designation Samnite was used in all different ways, uh, sometimes to refer to a cluster of, 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 of tribes, sometimes to refer to uh, um, sometimes to refer to anyone that was sort of hostile in these sorts of uh, in, in, in Roman sorts of conquest. Um, but what was what was true is that there were sort of four Samnite tribes located in this isolated terrain um, that had their own independent governmental structure, their own particular culture, their own ways of doing things. Now, there were several factors that contributed to the otherness of the Samnites, to them being seen as strangers. Roman conquest and integration was complicated uh, because the Samnites were surrounded by barren territory, living in isolated, mountainous, dispersed villages with some city strongholds. This is, by the way, strangely similar uh, to the largely uninhabited territory referred to as the wild fields of southern Ukraine uh, in, in, in earlier centuries. 
The Samnites retained their Oscan language while other uh, uh, communities adopted Latin. Again, note the Ukrainian language that emerges that causes great consternation uh, by the Russians. Moreover, though, the Samnites were comprised of a federation of four Oscan speaking tribes, they also developed a sentiment of shared ethnicity, which was actually probably brought about uh, um, by the Roman continually fighting them so that they begin to see themselves as bound together uh, into, a, into a community. The Samnites continued to be depicted as rebellious. Uh, remembered, for example, for Rome's alliance with its different uh, historic enemies, notably uh, Hannibal, Epirus, and the Gauls. That is, every war that existed, the Samnites were always on the other side, uh, um, allying with these, with these groups. They were also among the most anti-Roman of rebels in the social war, uh, um, which was a war for sort of Italian integration um, in which they were fighting for Samnite separation to have their own sort of self-determination uh, uh, um, opposite everything, every, uh, what, what others were actually fighting for uh, among the Italian associate, the Ito Italian allies. And they were described as alone among the Latins to take up arms after the grant of citizenship joining with Marius and Cinna against Sola, though likely staying out of the conflict for a while until, it, it, until they were eventually drawn into it, it had to be drawn into it. The Romans, who generally uh, pursued the first of Camillus's options, the desire to incorporate, uh, um, chose the other option, and that is the separation and extermination of the Samnites. With each Samnite defeat in the Samnite Wars, the Romans pushed further in, right? The Samnites suffered major losses, their towns destroyed or looted, their land confiscated and turned over uh, uh, to e for either private property or converted to public lands. And after the uh, Romans established control, they displaced segments of the Samnite population by destroying settlements and then putting in their own colonies. The Samnites have been involved in a lot of wars with Rome, right? Three Samnite wars that expand that spanned a hundred years: uh, the Pyrrhic War, uh, the Hannibalic War, uh, and then the Social War. So, so three hundred years of fighting, uh, um, of, of, of fighting, of keeping Rome at bay. Uh, a Samnite was chosen as one of the two leaders of the rebellion uh, against Rome. Uh, um, and and the, the battles with the Samnites were seen as some of the most violent uh, of the Roman battles that occurred on Italy. Sulla gives us some sense of the enduring hold of the Samnites on the Roman imagination when he states that, quote, not a Roman could ever live in peace so long as the Samnites held together as a separate people. To garner support for his return to Rome after the social war, Sola signed a treaty with the Italic peoples, though the Samnites were excluded from negotiations. The Samnites soon recognized uh, that they couldn't stay out of the struggle between Sola and Marius, the two leaders of Rome. And so they entered into the fray. Uh, uh, Marius, uh, uh, or, I mean, Sola singled out the captured Samnites in one battle, ordered them all slaughtered. Uh, there was one last uh, uh, sort of attempt uh, uh, to do battle at the, what's called the Battle of the Colleen Gate, where once again, the Samnites were separated out, they were killed, and the surviving Samnites were set up for extermination. From there, the remaining lands were looted and confiscated, right? The, 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 it was a path to wealth for those that were well-connected. The rest of the lands turned over to the Roman people. And after the Roman War, uh, uh, the Samnites that remained were put into a separate tribe. They weren't mixed with the other tribes uh, um, as if sort of to stay on guard, to, to not allow them to become integrated into, into Roman life. It's not just that any vestige of Samnite power was, was, was destroyed. It is how Roman writings memorialize this invisibility. Flora's comments, the Romans so thoroughly subdued and conquered this people and so demolished the very ruins of their cities that today one looks around to see where Samnian is on Samnite territory. It is difficult to imagine how there can have been material 
for 24 triumphs over them. That is to say how the Romans could have been so celebrated since so little remains uh, of, of, of anything that was before. That is to say that the place had been completely converted into space. But there was a second aspect of the Samnite a stranger uh, that is in tension with the first. Consigning a people to oblivion means they are forgotten. The Samnite a stranger was remembered. Um, it was abstracted and it was frozen in the Roman imagination at a particular point when Rome was asserting a territorial identity. Of all the groups, the Samnites were actually most like the Romans and the Romans understood that. Um, they were brutal, they were powerful in arms, they were warlike, uh, they practiced warlike things. Um, Livy portrays them as rustics, though that's a good thing uh, uh, because the Romans associated themselves with sort of a rustic tradition. Um, and uh, owing to these sort of shared characteristics to the, to the sense in which the Samnites were very similar to the Romans, um, their defeat was important in Rome's fashioning of its own identity as an Italian power, uh, um, as civilizing and converting space to place. Livy points, uh, puts it into the voice of a Samnite em uh, envoy the claim that the first Samnite war will decide who will govern Italy. And Diodorus describes the Samnites as fighting bitterly against the Romans for supremacy in a struggle lasting many years. Now, whether either side knew they were fighting for peninsular control is, is pretty uncertain. But important for our discussion here is how the conquest was given significance in the wake of the social war at a critical moment in Rome establishing its own identity and its own control over Italy. But as much as the Samnites were like the Romans, they could not be Roman. And they could not be Roman because they were defined by the Romans in, the, in a way that authorized Rome's control over this space. In the Roman imagination, uh, uh, the Samnites became tied to Rome's construction of its own identity, to particular characteristics that explained not only, uh, 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 not only that Rome rule, but why it should rule. The Samnites were not just rustics, they were primitives who lacked the Roman values of humanitas. They were treacherous. They were, uh, uh, um, they were greedy. They were less restrained compared to the Romans uh, in exacting vengeance. And there was also an exoticism that they were seen as exotic uh, um, that further abstracted the Samnite stranger. They practiced mysterious rituals. <clears throat> They, uh, uh, including the sort of the practice of human sacrifice, which the Romans no longer were doing. That exoticism uh, extended to their colored tunics, which you can see in this mosaic, the white linen, uh, uh, the white linen they wore, the shields that were glittering with gold and silver, uh, which, which contrasted with um, the Romans who trusted, right, not in this sort of glittery stuff, but in iron and courage, right, this sort of hardy sort of Roman idea and who believed that the Romans should have kind of a rough look uh, rather than this sort of exotic look. The Romans surrender uh, um, in the Battle of the Caudine Forks uh, uh, um, was remembered for its humiliation to Rome. Samnites did not just defeat the Romans, but almost conquered, quote, Roman valor and independence, a memory employed to demonstrate the danger of, of Rome's own move into luxury and to restore sort of the sense of Roman hardiness. The Romans continue to live in the, in, the, in, the, in the Roman imagination in the gladiator fights, interestingly enough. The Samnites were the ones that created the gladiator fights, not in the way the Romans did. The Roman, uh, the, the Samnite gladiators uh, were, were sort of uh, um, practices, uh, were ways of soldiers uh, staying in practice and demonstrating their prowess, but it didn't end in death. The Romans uh, not only borrowed the gladiator games, uh, but they dressed their gladiators as Samnites uh, uh, from the captured material that they had from the Samnites and continued to dress them as Samnites uh, uh, well, into the, well into the Principates. Uh, um, so that in some sense, right, this, 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 
this, this ability, right, right, Rome was able to sort of demonstrate their control over wildness by, by, by taming the Samnite in this gladiatorial arena. The danger posed by the Samnites and the magnitude of the victories affirmed Rome's glory. Uh, I, the victory so inspired, right? There's a, there, there were monuments uh, uh, to the to, to the different uh, battles. Uh, there were holidays to the different battles. Uh, Livy at one point uh, compares the uh, the Roman generals to, uh, to Alexander the Great and to Cyrus, the two great generals uh, um, that were that that are that were seen as sort of the the, the Roman coming of age uh, of its own establishment on the world stage. It is precisely the Samnite presence in the Roman imagination that served to, 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 to affirm Rome's conquest of wild space and the extension of civilized space. The Samnite wars were seen as a coming of age of Roman Imperium and a critical step in, the, in creating a unified Italy. The once isolated Samnite territories were now connected through uh, two large roads that were that were constructed as part of Rome's infrastructure projects, connecting and uniting uh, Italy uh, um, under this sort of Roman center, under this Roman control. Uh, uh, one sees the development of cities as well uh, on the Samnite territory, oftentimes built right on top of the other uh, settlements or the other cities to make those cities uh, completely, completely vanish. But the Samnite right, the stranger remained present, becoming part of Rome's own memory, a reminder and remainder of Roman conquest. So I use this episode to draw attention to the language of space and place and how critical it was uh, in, in, in how Rome understood its own conquest of space uh, and its own construction of place. Now we can talk about material interests or yearnings for power, all of those things are important. And all of these things are, are motivations uh, that figure into a larger equation. But in fact, um, we risk reducing human and national motivations simply to questions of interest. Uh, um, and by doing that, we will tend to uh, um, miss out on how these sorts of meanings that they attach to place, how one attaches to place, play out, how, how there's something more than simply sort of crass imperial conquest. Um, by not understanding the affective ways in which we understand place and space, I think we misunderstand um, why people are willing to sacrifice their lives. Um, and we understate the extent of the conflict that is occurring right now. So there are some intriguing points of intersection and departure. The Samnite Wars signaled the emergence of Rome as a military, economic, and cultural empire. The Ukrainian invasion marks a continuation of Russia's attempt to reclaim an empire. In both cases, the conquest of space is conceived of as part of a new history. The unification and civilization of Italy for Rome, a new Rome for Russia, that it recalls not just the glory of empire, but also a different conception of civilization itself, one that is explicitly anti-modern. And where Rome sought to Romanize conquered territories, creating something new, Putin imagines that he is reclaiming what is old. As Putin writes in his 2021 article on the historical unity of Russians and Ukrainians, Ukraine shares, quote, what is essentially the same historical and spiritual space. Spiritual space takes precedence over any other claims of space. Putinism, and that may be the best word for it, rejects Ukraine's existence as an independent identity. Note Putin's claim that the name Ukraine refers to the old Russian word Ukraina, which means periphery, referring to the border territories. That is right, it's on, it's, it's, it exists as the periphery right, of something bigger. Ukraine is a border that exists in relationship to a center. It is not an independent entity. Ukraine is not only seen as a creation of Russia, but as one Russian writer argues, it quote, does not have civil, civil, 
<laughs> civilizational, civilizational content, right? It's not civilized. I, um, it is a subordinate element of someone else's alien civilization. That alien civilization is, of course, Western capitalism and democracy that has imposed itself onto this spiritual space and uh, 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 through the corrupt aspirations of an independent nation state that is seen as divisive, as, 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 uh, um, as undermining um, and a sowing discord. There are implications for this Roman, I mean, for this Russian conception of space. The Ukrainian rejection of this spiritual space, and this, we can locate this as far back as Stalin, but certainly 1991 and the 2014 acts of self-determination loom large in Putin's mind, is not just a denial of shared roots, but it compares to sacrilege. That space has been despiritualized by Western corruption, which is what Putin means by Nazism. Note how the Russian media talks about the use of, quote, black magic by the Ukrainian troops, right? A statement of corrupted spirituality. Interestingly, right, we see that as well with the Samnites, right? Where the Russians, where the Romans associate the Samnites with black magic, with these mysterious rites and rituals uh, that make them different, uh, that make them uh, uh, that make them dangerous uh, in, in some sense, right? The foreign affairs pundit and Putin advocate, Timothy Sergeyev, in his terrifying article, What Should Russia Do With Ukraine?, decries that in reality, there is degradation. It's no accident we call them Nazis, said Marguerite de Simignon, right, who also has a Kremlin media group. Uh, uh, what makes you a Nazi is, once again, notice the comparison to the Samnites, is your bestial nature, your bestial hatred, and your bestial willingness to, te to tear out the eyes of children on the basis of nationality. Like the Samnites for the Russians, for the, uh, like the Samnites, for the Russians, the Ukrainians now appear as wild, exotic, and dangerous. This violation of the sacred by Ukraine justifies violence. As Sergeyev writes, Ukraine's actions demand, quote, atonement for guilt, for this violation of the overarching narrative of a new history. It requires the, the annihilation of the Ukrainian place, reducing it to a vacant space that can be, then be made, remade and reclaimed as a Russian place. As one writer writes, denazification will inevitably, inevitably also be de-Ukrainization, a rejection of the large scale artificial inflating of the ethnic composition of self-identification of the population of the territories of historical Little Russia, right, initiated by Soviet authorities. In addition, the Bandera element must be eliminated. Its re-education is impossible. Recall as well what we talked, right, the descriptions before of how Rome went about Romanizing Italy. The social swamp, which actively and passively supported it by action and inaction, must survive the hardships of war and learn the experience as a historical lesson and atonement for its guilt. But by this logic, what must be destroyed is the memory of place. That is why Putin has targeted churches, museums, schools, libraries, and monuments, which has very little to do with security and everything to do with memory. That is why in the temporal, temporarily occupied territories, we see attempts to replace Ukrainian state uh, street names with Soviet names, to remove and destroy Ukrainian books, and to impose Russian language as the language of instruction in Ukrainian schools. That is why Mariupol has been leveled. Like Rome did with Carthage, return now to the wild lands that it once was. And that is why, according to Sergeyev, Denazification must include the following steps. The installation of memorials, memorial signs, monuments to the victims of Ukrainian Nazism, the perpetuation of the memory of the heroes of the struggle against it. That is to say, right place must be, must be destroyed and replaced with other markers of Russian a place. 
like the Samnites, the Ukrainians are to remain as an altered memory, as a monument to Russia's reclamation of its own vision of civilization folded into Russia's heroic memories of World War II. There are two observations with which I want to conclude. First, decisions about space do not simply reduce to calculations of interest or cost, as many commentators suggest, but are tied to broader narratives of identity. That means we need to be clear about definitions of space. For example, Rome's founding narrative organized its conception of space as consisting of diffuse boundaries of incorporation, right? Conquest was certainly part of the equation, but there were a variety of options by which territories became part of Rome. The Samnites, right, who were most like Rome, um, I, I didn't want to be Roman and thus had to be defined in a different way, not as potentially uh, incorporated, but as extraordinarily dangerous as an ever present danger to the, to the, to the breakdown of, a, of, a, of, the, of the narrative of civilization. The Ukrainians who share much with Russia, including family members on both sides, don't wanna be Russian. And like the Samnites, they have their own language. You have your own monuments. You have memories connected to places. The space has meaning. It is connected to a narrative of self-determination. The Putin-esque conception of space is startlingly different. It is defined by a spiritual unity, which justifies, uh, uh, um, which does not allow for either self-determination or negotiation. Moreover, it allows the Russians to justify shameless violence, to destroy every memory that stands in the way of the realization of a new Rome. The narrative of identity that defines the space are mutually exclusive and will be resolved in my mind only when Putin's conception of space is replaced with another conception. That tells us something about the stakes of the game. That is to say, it's not gonna be solved by interest or by cost. Uh, uh, that there's a larger narrative in play here. There is a second observation, and this is a more satisfying payoff to this talk. The attack on Ukrainian space may have, and already has had, the paradoxical result of constructing and solidifying a Ukrainian sense of place, not as this town or that town or this people or that people, right? But as an emerging nation state. The Samnites, once a loose confederation of unaffiliated tribes, developed an identity through centuries of conflict with Rome. Already we see in, uh, in Ukraine, a reinforced notion of a we, as a multi-ethnic people bound together in defense of their home, in defense of their place. It is worth noting that this result actually runs contrary to and reverses a global trend toward the sort of fragmentation of the nation state, including in the United States. Perhaps we can learn as a world or relearn what makes the nation state worth defending from the experience of Ukraine. Thank you very much.